anointing, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you say that the anointing breaks the yoke, Lord God, over our lives, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, as Terry kind of digs into the word this morning, Lord, thank you, Lord, that your plan is to bring freedom, to bring Mm. healing, to bring deliverance, Lord, to bring purpose, to bring Mm. life, Lord God. Mm. And so we open our hearts this morning and we say, Lord, have your way. Uh, In Terry, through Terry, Lord God, in Mm. us, through us, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great to see you all. Um, so we finished our series on partnership. Is this loud? Just because now I'm talking in a minute, I'm going to be preaching. So then it's really going to get loud. So, but uh, we finished our series on partnership, and we had Jody come in last week. Did an outstanding time, both north and south. And uh, huh? Two weeks ago, what happened last week? Huh? Oh, Andrew preached. Good job, Andrew. You know, when Andrew said what Sunday is today, I I was the only one that yelled out Baptism Sunday, and I said to Chris and Cheryl, at least the pastor knows which Sunday it is, and then I can't remember what happened last week, but then again, I can barely remember what I had for lunch yesterday, so that's not a... Yeah, that's why we put down... That's why, exactly. Anyway, just praying as to to where we go from here, and uh, really felt like God put stewardship on my heart, and... uh, feels like a good, it feels like as God started to speak to me, I'm like, just it feels like a good outflow after our partnership series. And so we might stay here for a couple of weeks and uh, just see where God takes us on this stewardship journey. The principle of stewardship is simply this. It is taking responsibility for what God has given us while understanding that we own nothing. It's simply that. It's taking responsibility for everything God has given us while understanding that we owe nothing. Seems like such a contradiction in terms. Here's a dictionary definition of stewardship. Simply this, the task of supervising or taking care of something. The task of supervising or taking care of something. And then a stronger definition, uh, dictionary definition would be this. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. The central biblical theme, the essence of the biblical understanding of stewardship is managing everything God brings into the life of a believer in a manner that honors God. Isn't that beautiful? Managing everything that God brings into a believer's life in a manner that honors God. So let's start in the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. So it's a good place to start. Start in the beginning. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we read this incredible story of creation. We get 26 verses down. Genesis 1.26. Then God said... Let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that there's a reason for the creation of man, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. That's where the principle of stewardship starts, right from the beginning. God's original intent for man was that man steward everything God has created. You doing okay? In Psalm 24, verse 1, just reestablishes that thing that I said. We take care of it, but we don't own it. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's, and everything in the world is and all who live in it. So God, while God hands over stewardship, while he hands over management, he never gives up ownership. Are are you doing okay? So we are called to manage, we're called to administrate, we're called to steward what God has created in such a way so that it brings honor to God. 
You doing okay? Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna dive a little deeper here, and I just we're gonna just hit the pause button on that and understand this. There are rules for interpreting scripture, right? There are rules. The Bible doesn't mean what we think it means. The Bible doesn't mean what we want it to mean. And the Bible doesn't even necessarily mean what we believe it to mean. Because we can think, want, or believe wrongly. Does that make sense? It's not how I believe. You cannot believe in gravity. It doesn't make it not so. Does it make sense? So what we believe, especially when it comes to Scripture, is not really important unless we are believing accurately. Are you doing okay? The Bible means what the Bible means. And sometimes for us to understand that, we've got to put in a little bit of work. There are rules and science of interpreting Scripture. It's called hermeneutics. And I'm going to look at one of those principles this morning for us as we start on this principle of stewardship, the first mention principle. And so the first mentioned principle is the principle by which the interpretation of any verse is aided by considering the first time that subject appears in Scripture. Are you doing okay? That's the first mention. So if you want to accurately translate Scripture, if you want to accurately interpret Scripture, this is one of the rules that we can do. We can go back to the very first time that subject is mentioned in Scripture and understand that the first mention is going to be fairly accurate. We're going, to carry, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. In general, the first time something is mentioned in Scripture, it carries with it the meaning which we will be consistent throughout Scripture. Okay? So we've looked at stewardship as a first mention. Genesis 1, verse 1. Genesis 1, verse 26. First mention of God saying, everything I've created is for you to administrate. Everything I've created is for you to steward so that it brings glory to my name. The first mentioned principle is simply this, a key that unlocks the door into further truth. That's the first mention. First mentioned principle is a guide to discovering the truth in its progressive unfolding. So Revelation is progressive, right? Revelation is progressive. If we only had Genesis, if we only had the book of Genesis, we, we would have a picture of God. We definitely have a picture of God in, Genesis, in the book of Genesis. But the revelation is progressive. The revelation unfolds throughout all of Scripture so that by the time we get to Revelation, we've got a much better picture of God than if we just had Genesis. Are you doing okay? It's progressive. First, uh, first mentioned principle is the first link in a chain of revelation. First mentioned principle is a seed which has within it the full truth that is developed in subsequent mentions. So it's the full truth. It's a seed that has the full truth. And if you look at any seed, we're going to touch on this a little bit as we go through this thing, but seed time and harvest. If you look at the seed, the seed has everything in it to form the full tree or the full fruit or whatever it is. Does that make sense? And so that's the first mention principle. It just is the seed, but it has everything in there that is going to come from it all the way later down the road. Okay. So when we understand that, we have a little bit broader and better understanding of the breadth of the principle of stewardship. When we look at that thing and we understand this is not about, and we're going to talk about this, it's not about this thing. It's not about this narrow definition of stewardship. What is meant by this word has varied greatly through churches and through church history. Some think stewardship is simply about tithing and finances. We just have to steward our money. Well, that is true. We do have to steward our money. But that's a very, very narrow definition. We're going to be running a Financial Peace University class in the fall, because I do think this thing of stewarding our finances, of getting our, of getting our finances in God's order is absolutely critical, and it's going to be more and more critical in the future of this nation. Are, are you doing okay? We're going to be running that financial peace class in the fall. If you haven't done the class before, or if you did it years ago, I would strongly suggest 
that you sign up for this class. Details will follow, but in the meantime, you can speak to Jeff Birch or Ben Scott, and uh, they, they're going to be spearheading that for us, and uh, just speak to them and get some ideas. Something stewardship means volunteering. Something stewardship is just about finances. Something stewardship is about volunteering. And I want to tell you, I, I think we need to get rid of that word. I think we need to get rid of the word volunteering. Because when we get saved, we give up the right to volunteer. A volunteer means we can opt in and opt out. But when we get saved, we get saved into a life of service and stewardship. Are you doing okay? So there isn't really an opt in or opt out here. If you're saved, this is the life you got saved into. Jesus himself said this, I came to serve, not to be served. He didn't say, I came to volunteer. He said, I came to serve. The question we ask ourselves as we, as we embark on the stewardship journey is this. What does this look like? What does this look like? When God pours himself out for us, withholding nothing. Are we doing okay so far? Is that, is that an accurate statement? God poured himself out for us, withholding nothing. Is, is that an accurate statement? Okay, well, that's about three or four of you. So the rest of you clearly should have responded to Chris's call for salvation. <laughs> you should have had a massive response to that, to Chris throwing out the net. God pours himself out for us. What does this look like when God pours himself out for us, withholding nothing, and in response, we offer ourselves back to him, withholding nothing from him? Yeah. What does this look like? Biblical pictureship of stewardship is much broader, much more captivating, much more inspiring. The biblical picture of stewardship looks like whole life discipleship. Whole life discipleship. Every aspect of my life turned over to God. Every aspect of my life managed in such a way. Every aspect of my life stewarded in such a way that it brings maximum glory to God. You doing okay? I think that's the antidote for compartmentalized Christianity. I was going to church on Sunday, but I do my thing for the rest of the week. All right? This is the antidote for that. And, I, and I'm telling you, this, this little thing here was what I felt God speak to me about in the context of me praying for our nation and in the context of me praying for Redemption City Church. This is the thing that we have to stop compartmentalizing our faith. We have to stop saying, okay, this is just this, and this is work, and this is business, and that's that, and that's that. When we understand stewardship, we understand that it embraces every vocation and every calling of every believer. To fulfill, to fulfill God's ultimate vision of getting the gospel to our neighbors, neighborhoods, and nations of the world. It embraces every vocation and every calling of every believer. Biblical stewardship would include transformational generosity. Generosity that transforms communities and societies. Biblical stewardship would include workplace ministry. Biblical stewardship would include business as mission. Biblical stewardship would include a theology of work. There is dignity in work. There is dignity in work. I, I, don't, know, I don't know where all these recordings go, and so I've got to be careful sometimes using real, real examples and real illustrations, but uh, there was a situation that we were part of where, where the husband of this wife died uh, very suddenly, very quickly, and as traumatic as that is, and he was on staff at the church, so we continued to pay her. We continued to pay her his salary, and our thinking behind that was this, that the, these kids, and he had young kids, these kids have just lost their father. 
We don't need them to lose their mother as well and force her to go out and get work, right? So we continue to pay his full salary to his widow. And we did that for nine months, for a year. And you could see at that point, at that point, she was in a downward spiral. And I was a lone voice on that eldership and got yelled at on that eldership for saying she needs to go get a job now. There is dignity in that, friends. There is dignity in getting up, getting out of your pajamas, putting your makeup on if you're a girl. I just, as I started to say that, I'm like, that could, as I started to say that, I'm like, in this society that we live in, I just need to bring some clarity to that. There is dignity in work. It, it, is, it is, again, one of those things. God has created us for work, friends. And we need to have a theology of work. Are, are you doing okay? It brings dignity. That was one of the things that was restored in the Reformation, that all work had dignity before God. Before the Reformation, before the Reformation, it was only clergy that had dignity. Like, if you're not in the ministry, you count for nothing. The Reformation restored this thing, that all vocations had dignity before God. Are you doing okay? Biblical stewardship would include every believer finding his or her place in fulfilling their call to service and ministry in all aspects of life. In all aspects of life. I've quoted this often, Matthew 6.33. We were, we, were sitting in a, we were sitting in a room with, with Dudley, with Ty's dad, and the, que- the question was about a financial question, but it has such, so much of a broader application, Matthew 6.33. And we all know that Scripture, in all things, consider first as a matter of priority and order, right? Those two things are different. Priority, yes, this is my primary responsibility. But first in order, first, before anything else. Two different things, but first. Consider first the kingdom of God. And Dudley re-quoted that Scripture, and it's actually it's hard for me to quote Because I've used it so much, it's like settled in my spirit. It's so hard for me to quote the actual scripture because I always quote what Dudley said. In all things, big and small, consider first the kingdom of God. In all things, big and small. That's what whole life discipleship looks like. That's what stewardship looks like. How are we going to bring God glory in all aspects of life if we cannot, in the big and the small, consider first the kingdom of God. Are you doing okay? Matthew 5. Matthew 5. You can go there with me if you want. Matthew 5, verse 13. We're going to read from 13 to 16. Matthew 5, from verse 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, How can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Remember what we spoke about. Stewardship is about bringing God glory with everything that he brings to our lives, right? Speaks about salt and light. Salt of the earth, light of the world. Salt of the earth, light of the world. The salt in illustration here, salt preserves, right? We we make a thing in South Africa called biltong. It's different to jerky, the, your, your closest equivalent would be jerky, but biltong is different. Biltong is not sweet. It is salty. And the reason you put salt on this meat as you hang it up to dry is to preserve the meat. Salt preserves. 
right? And so when the scripture is saying here, you are the salt of the earth, the implication is that society and what is going on in our culture and our country right now is in decay. And so we are called to be that salt. We are called to be those people that as we steward everything God has given us, we see everything as the call of God. Dignity in all vocations, dignity in all of this thing. We are those that are going to preserve what God has delivered in our communities, in our nation, and in our society. Are you doing okay? The light illustration again implies that the world is in darkness. And the Bible calls us to be the light of the world, salt of the earth, light of the world. Revelation says this, that Jesus is the light of the world. Are you doing okay? Jesus is the light of the world. And that's what I'm saying, man. This has to be the antidote for us going, okay, well, Jesus on Sunday, right? Jesus around my dinner table when I eat with my family. Jesus here, Jesus there. But actually, when I'm out in the world, I can't talk about it, I can't mention it, and I can't live like it because I'll get persecuted. And truthfully, maybe you will. But biblically, we don't have a choice. Are you doing okay? Biblically, we don't have a choice other than to be salt and light. Salt of the earth. Preserve. Stand up. Be counted. Light. Let's bring Jesus to this world. We're going to land for this week. When we understand that we are called to be stewards, we understand this, and I'm going to just take a little bit of license with this, world, with this word. When we understand that we are called to be stewards, we, are, we understand that we are called to be creators and cultivators. Now, creator is not like, I don't create like God created, out of nothing, I make something, right? But there are things that we create, there are things that we build, there are things that we develop in our lives. And so that's, I'm using that word a little bit loosely, Right? When we understand stewardship, we understand we are called to be creators and cultivators. We create a marriage and we cultivate it. You don't just get married and go, okay, well, it is what it is. See, I feel like I'm getting less amens the longer this sermon. <laughs> I should just call it, yeah, just call it. Just call it quit. See, that's my time. See, I'm just like, okay, let's. Amen. <laughs> well, let me just point it this way. Sandy and I created a marriage and we cultivate. I don't know what the rest of you do. I just, I just. <laughs> we create and we cultivate. You start something and you feed it. You start something and you develop it. You start something and you maintain some level of responsibility for it. You feed into that thing. Create a marriage and you cultivate it. You create children and we cultivate those children. We continue to speak into them and raise our kids and invest in them. We create a career and we cultivate it if we understand stewardship. And we understand that if our career is worked out right in this context, any career can bring glory to God. Are you doing okay? We create a business and we cultivate it. Remember what I said earlier, business as mission. We create a business and we cultivate it to the glory of God. Stewards are those that cultivate rather than consume. Stewards are those that are producers rather than consumers. Stewards are those that don't look for the path of least resistance, but look for the path that will bring the most glory to God. Path of least resistance is easy. It's way easy, but it doesn't necessarily always bring glory to God. And so sometimes we just get this, and it's like, man, this is going to be way harder, but is it going to bring glory to God? That has to be our question, right? The Aussies have the same. And I think the, I think the Aussies just verbalize sometimes what the rest of the world is thinking. Because if you ask an Australian to do something, he doesn't want to do it. He just goes, too hard. So it might not necessarily even be hard. He just doesn't want to do it. So he just goes, too hard. But I think they've just given, 
They've just verbalized something that sometimes we all think. It's like God's requiring this thing, and we don't say it too hard, but we think it, and we just move on. Are you doing okay? That's the path of least resistance. Well, this feels hard, so I'm not going to do it. I'll just go this way. It's so much easier. I'm not going to live whole life discipleship where I understand that I am called to steward my finances. I'm called to steward my time. I'm called to steward my career. I'm called to steward all of these things. Not in autonomy, in accountability to God, so that in the end, my life will bring glory to God. Are you doing okay? And that is going to be hard. It is going to be hard. It might be too hard. But we have the Holy Spirit. We have clear instruction. We have each other. We have all these things around us so that we can bring glory to God in every aspect of our lives. Let's stand together.